videos such as these made by apologists that are very popular amongst Muslims says Islam does not teach about doing any activity that could be deemed as corrupt. This includes not to tell lies, deceive, steal or fabricate as this is what the Quran and Muhammad teaches. In his video he smugly says Islam is a pure religion where honesty and trustworthiness is the normal order of things and in the typical fashion of those seeking confirmation bias it is lapped up by its followers. A genuine question needs to be raised. If this is the case then why is it that the reality does not reflect this? A study after study show how Muslim majority countries rank as some of the worst when it comes to corruption and when Muslims migrate to non-Muslim countries corruption and dishonest behaviour becomes rife when compared to people of other faith communities. It seems the honesty and trustworthiness rhetoric is only a veneer hence why it does not correspond with reality. So moving away from the apologetics in this video it will be shown whether there is anything from Muhammad's behaviour that could constitute corruption and dishonesty and whether there is anything incriminating in the Quran on the subject. First, for some statistics. In a research conducted by Transparency International, it found mostly Muslim majority countries topping the corruption index. Seven out of ten countries were implicated in the corruption table. High up in the index included wealthy Gulf states such as Qatar. So it's not just about poverty and civil wars. The least corrupt countries were consistently non-Muslim countries. This state of affairs is not coincidental or a blip. It's been the case for many years. Looking into the reasons, Muhammad Amin, a Cambridge graduate, Muslim accountant, who has experience within Islamic finance, in 2010 wrote, Why are Muslim majority countries more corrupt? He acknowledges that Muslim majority countries are clustered in the bottom half of the index. The lower a country ranks, the greater the perceived level of public sector corruption. In summary, he concluded that poverty is only one part of the explanation, as he believed the outdated theories of Islamic governance are also an important reason. The link to his article is in the description. Other Muslim researchers have focused on their own country's corruption, such as this one on the world's most populous Muslim country, Indonesia. Due to so many studies finding Muslim countries to be corrupt, University of California Berkeley's professor, Dr. Stephen Fish, focused onto this topic into more detail. He uncovers his findings in chapter 4 of his book. As the corruption index shows Muslim countries as the most corrupt, it should not come as a surprise and be of no coincidence. Muslims own role model, Muhammad, behaved in a manner that could only be deemed as corrupt, and that is being generous as his behaviour was far worse. Firstly, he allowed lying and deception to further his cause, even if that meant killing someone to get rid of them because they merely upset him. For example, this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari recounts the murder of a non-violent Jewish man called Ka'b bin Ashraf. He was a poet whose fatal mistake was that he only criticised Muhammad for his killing of Meccans at the Battle of Badr. So at Muhammad's insistence, he sought out someone to assassinate him. A Muslim called Muhammad bin Maslama agreed, and Muhammad the Prophet agreed and approved and said bin Maslama can lie or use any form of dishonesty or deception to gain Ka'b's trust. So he did as Muhammad commanded by pretending that they had turned against Muhammad. When Ka'b believed them and allowed them to get close, they killed him. In very much the same way as Muslim terrorists do today, they severed his head and then shouted Allahu Akbar. 
they took his decapitated head and presented it to Muhammad, who praised Allah for the action and thereafter ordered to kill every Jew. This is mentioned in Kitab al-Tabaqat, written by early Muslim scholar Ibn Sa'ad, volume 2, page 37. It is quite a shame and embarrassing that Muhammad was accused of stealing by his very own followers. This is referenced in Quran verse 3161, which was revealed to exonerate him. A red velvet cloth went missing after one of his raids, and some of his fellow Muslims accused Muhammad of having taken it. They could only do this if they did not fully trust him. To date, that red velvet cloth has never been found. Despite the apologetics of Muhammad being known as an honest and trustworthy man, apparently even amongst non-Muslim pre-Islamic pagans, in reality he did not have a good reputation even amongst his own peers as he was in the habit of ordering caravan raids. He was associated as a criminal which he himself proudly acknowledges. For example, in Sunan Abu Dawud, 3666, Muhammad says, Rejoice, you group of Sa'alik. Here the actual word from the Hadith is shown circled in red. In this source called Sunnah.com, it translates the word Sa'alik as poor, but it does not actually mean this. The Arabic word Sa'alik actually means thieves, murderers, swindlers, tramps, vagabonds. In other words, those poor people who resort to becoming outlaws, bandits, miscreants, reprobates, criminals, looters, as evidenced by this or any other Arabic dictionary source. In Sahih Bukhari 3516, it confirms the type of people that were his followers when it says, quote, al akra ibn Habis said to the Prophet, Nobody gave you the pledge of allegiance but the robbers of the pilgrims, i.e., those who used to rob the pilgrims from the tribes of Aslam, Gifar, Muzaina. This hadith proves that Muhammad and his followers were criminals, namely robbers and thieves. In a hadith in Bukhari, volume 4, chapter 8, page 108, Muhammad says his livelihood is earned by the spear and the tax from non Muslims. In the commentary, explains what is meant by livelihood, which is war booty. Curiously, this hadith could not be found in the online sunnah.com source at the time of recording, but can be found in the paper print book form. Muhammad was indeed a swindler as he made his prophethood into a business when he was asking for money for consultations with him. Quran 58.12 was revealed about this. In the commentary it says no one paid him this consultation fee except Ali, who spent every bit he had, meaning Muhammad made his prophethood into a business enterprise. It gets worse, he took from his own cousin and son-in-law for consultations knowing he did not have much, yet still took from him anyway until he had nothing more left to give. As no one else gave him anything, the clause if you do not find the means, was revealed to say people no longer had to give anything for consultation with him. But it's a redundant clause, as no one gave him anything anyway, probably realising what he was up to, namely, trying to make money by saying he was a prophet, something no other prophet did before him. Muhammad told people they can lie in certain situations. In Tirmidhi 1939, and Abu Dawud 4921, he says lying is permitted in three cases for the Muslims. In various classical hadith collections, it mentions the hadith about Muhammad saying Muslims can use concealment to attain their needs. In Arabic, this form of deception is called kitman, which is a method of misleading people by not disclosing full details. The hadith has been authenticated by hadith classifier Albani, who says this hadith is authentic according to me. 
See in the description where Islamic sources approve his method for hadith classification. Even the Quran in 328 allows lying to disbelievers. This is the Taqiyya verse, so it's not just a Shia issue. The verse starts with, let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends. Then it explains the Arabic word Tukah, from which the word Taqiyya is derived from, which means when Muslims are in a weak position, they can save themselves by lying to disbelievers by speaking to them in a friendly way whilst their heart dislikes it, as explained by Tafsir ibn Abbas and Jalalin. This is the very definition of a lie as found in any dictionary. The Oxford Reference Dictionary says, a lie is a statement not in accordance with the mind of the speaker made with the intention of deceiving. Other dictionaries say something similar. Therefore, Muhammad and the Quran do allow lying and dishonesty especially to non-Muslims, as part of their divine teaching. Quran 3.54 says Allah is the best of deceivers. Pictal's translation is closest to the actual meaning of the word makal, which he translates as scheme, here circled in red. The verse uses the verb three times, once in connection to the disbelievers and twice in connection to Allah. It is often translated as plotted or planned, a word Muslim translators have changed to a softer meaning when in reality it has a sinister meaning, which is to deceive. This will be evidenced next. Within Arabic dictionaries, or even a simple search will uncover that the word makar does not mean plan or plot. In Arabic, the word for plan is khutta not makar. The reason why it is mistranslated when the word is connected to Allah is because makar is a bad word as it means to deceive along with other synonyms. So if this is the standard of the God Muslims worship, how can anyone expect a higher standard from his Prophet and his followers? To elaborate on this, if Muhammad and Allah are partial to the occasional lie, deception, dishonesty, double-dealing, thieving, swindling and scheming, especially against the non-believer, then what harm is there if its followers do the same? Their practice will inevitably, consciously or subconsciously, have an impact upon their behaviour, who show no consideration for their own country and own people, but also often show complete disregard for their host communities and the non-Islamic laws in which some find themselves. It is manifesting itself with criminal behaviour, imprisonment, as more proportion of Muslims in the UK end up in prisons compared to any other religious groups. And it's not just in the UK. Other countries with high populations of Muslims have similar problems, whether it's Australia, France, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, US, Canada, and so on and so forth. By way of some real-world illustrations, the fraud and counterfeiting centres in the UK are mainly perpetrated by those who are of a Muslim background. This article found in ITV News explains the racket is linked to drugs, human trafficking, terrorism and other criminal enterprises. Unemployment and living on government handouts is also high for the Muslim community compared to other religious communities. So is benefit fraud. The vast majority of the sexual grooming against young girls are perpetrated by those calling themselves Muslims. So is the cash for crash scams, which are mostly perpetrated by those who identify as Muslims, and the list goes on and on. So in conclusion, when Muslims are shown to be corrupt, use deception, engage in double dealing or lie, it is not an aberration of the faith. In fact, there are teachings within its sources and religious edicts found in the example of their prophet, their God, and amongst Muslims in general who resort to or advocate corrupt practices. In other words, it's scripture, whether the Quran or Hadith highlight such actions and promote it. It is true there are opposing verses and scriptural references, but this only highlights the contradictions within the religion. 
However, as long as there are such traditions that promote corruption, then such behaviours can and will always be justified by some, something that speaks volumes about the religion and its followers. The fact that the majority of the Muslims in the world do not engage in such activities is not an indicator that it is not part of the religion, nor do the majority of any faith engage in such activities, by the way. On the contrary, for Muslims it is argued that these people are better than their religion and their prophet. The point remains, as long as a significant and rising percentage do these practices, that in itself is statistically significant enough to warrant a discussion and the need to highlight such issues. This is opposed to the usual rhetoric of whitewashing the issue about how Islam only promotes honesty and truth, which is actually very far from the real truth.